thankful to be here this evening, and it's hard to follow a, a lesson that, that we had this morning from Grant, so it was, I appreciate uh, sitting at his feet and learning from him uh, this morning. We're going to be studying from the book of Hosea. We, of course, many of us may remember we did a class on Hosea probably a few years ago now, but Hosea was a contemporary of Isaiah, prophesying during the reigns of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Judah, and also during the reign of Jeroboam, the king of Israel. The message of Hosea was of grace and love, a love that remained constant even though scorned by his unfaithful people, the Israelites. The most memorable part, probably not to Hosea, but to, to us from studying this book, is his marriage to Gomer, which served as a symbolic message to, to Israel. We're going to look at this, this marriage in, in more depth in this lesson. Hosea was commanded to, to marry a woman who was raised in the environment of idolatry, of, of whoredom or uh, harlotry. We learned that in chapter 1. It was a tragic marriage, but it also mirrored the, the marriage that Israel had to God. She took for herself lovers and committed adultery. In chapter 3, she bore three children, a son named Jezreel, a daughter named Lo-Ruhamah, and a son named Lo-Ami. But even after all of this, Hosea redeemed her and brought her back home. So, for just a moment, I want to go back to the text that, that was read for us just a minute ago. Go back to Hosea chapter 2 and verse 19 and just reread those so they're fresh in our, our, our memory. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. What does it mean to betroth? This isn't uh, something that, that, we, that we hear quite often. Um, this, of course, is in this passage uh, multiple times in, in, in our text for this evening. But it's, it's important to, to note that this is not a term that, we, that we're familiar with. I often, uh, Martha often says that uh, I'm, I'm an 80-year-old because I've, I like old things. I like old movies and follow... I like Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne. The, the, those are my movie star heroes. Um, and so this word, of course, was familiar to me. And if you, went, if you go to Google, and I, I did this this morning, and, and you notice that you can do a, a word history on, on just about any word. And this, of course, was popular in the uh, early to mid-1800s and, of course, has um, waned in, in uh, popularity since then. So, of course, it's not something that you would hear. But betrothed is the Hebrew verb, uh, and I may pronounce this wrong, uh, eras. It means to pledge in marriage to become engaged. A betrothal in those days was much more binding uh, than today. It, it was as if the marriage had already taken place. And we could substantiate that claim going to some other passage. I don't want to take up our time, but in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 7, chapter 22, verse 23 and 24. But one thing we can learn from these passages, and we're going to break down uh, these two passages in much more depth, but we're, we're going to learn that a strong, uh, a storm-proof marriage needs a strong and deep foundation. Did you know that the Sears Tower was anchored 200 feet beneath the surface? Well, that is where the strength is. That strength of the Sears Tower is deep beneath the surface and unseen to the human eye. A storm-proof marriage needs to be built correctly. There's often many reasons stated for divorce, but one thing we know for certain is that domestic disputes never destroyed a properly built marriage. Mental cruelty never destroyed destroyed a properly built marriage. Incompatibility never destroyed a properly built marriage. Financial problems never destroyed a properly built marriage. In-law problems never destroyed a properly built marriage. Intimacy problems never destroyed a properly built marriage. What kind of gifts will God give this marriage, give your marriage, 
if you're if you're looking to be married to to secure this bride. Well, in the Bible times, it was common for the groom to offer gifts to the to the family of of the bride, and this would signal this would be a, a, would mean a couple things. It would, it would uh, signal his intention to wed, and it would also cement this agreement, that this new uh, binding contract, we'll say. And Gomer's unfaithfulness demonstrated symbolically, and, and really it really happened, the, the breaking of the covenant between God and, and Israel. And these gifts that we are reading about in in 19 and, and 20 and Hosea 2, they, they were presented to Israel from God and they are indeed the rocks that our marriages must be built on rather than the sands of the foolish. So I want to look at five things tonight as we consider this, this principle of building a storm-proof marriage. First of all, we must build on the rock of the covenant of marriage instead of the sand of a contract. Marriage is for life. That is forever. We see that in the beginning of verse 19. I will betroth you to me forever. Hosea wrote this in forever is permanent, everlasting, endless. And it suggests a covenant, not a contract. What forever is, whatever storms weather our marriage, my commitment to you is everlasting. Whatever happens, I'm staying with you. This also symbolizes God's commitment to the Israelites despite their perpetual unfaithfulness. Furthermore, Jesus said in, 19, in Matthew 19.6, What God has joined together, let no man separate. Isn't it interesting, and I found this as I was studying this, and that there are various animals, many animals uh, actually, that mate for life. And I'm just going to list a few. Bald eagles, doves, hornbills, wolves, beavers, the Canadian geese that we see all over the place at this time of the year, and, and butterfly, butterfly fish are just a few. In fact, the black vulture is also one that mates for life, and they will sometimes kill the unfaithful members of their species who are unfaithful as far as mating goes. Countries with low divorce rates uh, are often are often they, because they go into marriage with the idea that marriage is for life. It's not something you can just start over again. We also want to emphasize while we're talking about a storm-proof marriage and the, the rock of a covenant, I want to emphasize that marriage is between man and woman as well. God ordains this marriage between man and woman, not man and man or woman and woman but man and woman. Genesis 2:20 to 24. I want to go through, go read that for just a second if you want to keep your fingers in Hosea chapter 2. Genesis 2, 20. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a, helpful, a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which had been taken out of the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So this verse teaches that God intended man's helpmeet to be woman. It's not Adam and Steve. Adam and Eve. Our society doesn't respect marriage anymore. We can, we, we can, we just know that there's no respect for marriage. We are on a constant threat from homo homosexuals who want to destroy the biblical view of marriage. Consider a universal truth which, with, which homosexuals cannot overcome ever is that a man and man cannot produce a child together. A woman and a woman cannot produce a child together. And that's as graphic as I'm going to get. But also another point is that marriage, it is a covenant. It requires a covenant between three, three people, man, woman, and God. 
Proverbs 2.17 refers to this covenant as the covenant of her God. Malachi 2.14, wife of thy covenant. Genesis 15.17, we read about God establishing a covenant with, with Abraham. Here in Hosea 2.19-20, God is establishing a, a contract with Israel despite the fact that they are going to be unfaithful to God over and over and over again. And despite the fact that they've shown their unfaithfulness in the past, God is nonetheless going to establish this contract, this, or rather this covenant with, with Israel. And then now we consider this marriage of Hosea and, and Gomer, a, Gomer, a prostitute, and her unfaithfulness demonstrates once again the breaking of the covenant uh, between God and Israel. And for, perhaps it's time at, at this point of lesson that we, we consider our thinking on, the, on these points is the world acts as if marriage is just a contract that can be broken and we can just start over again. I, I had a co-worker once that, that uh, kind of laughed at when someone asked him about his marital status and he said uh, he said he was divorced and uh, he said well you, you know you can just shut down and reboot again kind of like you do a computer then that's how people view marriage and you can just start over again and just start fresh and it's just a contract you can start over and it can be voided you can just start once again if you think marriage is a contract then you need to consider that in, in light of what God says. In God's eyes, marriage is a covenant. Proverbs 24, 3, that we understand how wisdom in the Bible, wisdom is thinking how God thinks. And that's how we learn to become wise, by learning to think how God thinks. We need to discard divorce as an option and resolve to fix our problems through prayer and through humility. <coughs> the disciples understood the seriousness of marriage turning to Matthew chapter 19, 10 through 11. This was a serious thing for them, and, and we know that. We know that his God's instructions in Matthew chapter 19 were not confusing. The disciples, all of them that were there, they understood clearly what was being said. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 10, the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, then it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not all men can accept the statement, but only those whom it has been given. They understood this was serious, and maybe, maybe it's better that we not marry. Once again, marriage is serious, serious business, and it is a covenant between God and your spouse. Secondly, we need to build on the rock of righteousness and justice instead of the sands of reproach and prejudice. In our Daniel study, from I believe last year now, we we read that Daniel told uh, Nebuchadnezzar what he needed to do. Daniel 4:27 says, "Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity." Here, Daniel records his decision to not to to not practice righteousness and to show mercy. Righteousness was a scarce gift in, in Israel. Righteousness can be de defined as uh, virtue, decency, uh, honesty, uprightness, uh, honorable, and respect. It's one thing I appreciate from the Proverbs study is just, it's just chock full of wisdom. And I'm sure there's probably some in the adult class who feel the same. I want to turn, um, just briefly turn to Proverbs chapter 14 and, and look at a passage there. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So this was a gift that meets the basic need of a, of a fallen nation. And that is righteousness. When the foundation of marriage is laid with the gift of righteousness, justice will also follow. Justice is impartiality, honesty, integrity, and fairness. Justice precipitates the requirement for instruction, for the, the requirement for direction and guidance. The Bible is our only reliable source to, to, that we should be consulting with regarding 
what God expects of the husband and wife in the marriage relationship. Uh, another author put it this way, righteousness and justice live and thrive in the atmosphere of loving kindness and compassion. Righteousness and justice th live and thrive in an atmosphere of loving kindness and compassion. I think that's well said. Just as we build upon the rock of a covenant and a rock of righteousness and justice, we also build on the rock of loving kindness instead of the sand of conditional love. We all know what conditional love means. Conditional love is this if love. If you do this, I will love you. If you do this and that, then, then I'm, I'm going to love you. That's what conditional love is. Conditional love is too impersonal. It makes the other person wonder if they are <coughs> worthy or eligible for your love. A study of agape love in, in the Bible teaches that agape is the love of commitment. We could uh, learn about that in John 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 13, Ephesians 5. But love, it is endless. It is forever. We, we, we talked about that in the beginning of 19. The idea that marriage is forever. But also loving kindness, love is, is endless. It is forever. Psalms 136.1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Steadfast, steadfast love is that phrase is found 193 times in the Bible. We need to strive to be in a place where we can put away anger and we can respond inside of us with empathy and compassion. These are the products of, a, of the act of love where we use empathy and compassion. Just as we are building upon the rock of loving kindness, we build upon the rock of compassion instead of the sands of coldness and bitterness. Compassion is sympathy, concern, kindness, empathy, and understanding. In the Good News translation, in uh, the latter part of verse 19, it refers to this this, this phrase, the uh, word compassion, is constant love and mercy. So this love and mercy, it's constant. It's, once again, forever, never ending. We learn to be compassion, uh, compassionate. Nobody likes to be around someone who's cold and a bitter person who's upset at the world. I'm sure we, we work with people like that where you know they want to find whatever they can and they're just going to complain about it. But nobody wants to be around somebody like that. But for the husband, let's, I want to turn to Proverbs chapter 31, and we're going to look at a few verses in uh, Proverbs 31 in the next few minutes. But in Proverbs 31, you know, we often think of this as the, um, the description of a worthy woman, but really when you go through here, you could, you could pull out things that define the kind of man that, that a woman needs to find as well. We kind of talked about this in the high school class. Because um, a, lot, a lot of times these books focus on, these class books focus on the worthy woman and there's, there's a lot of things in here that the man needs to um, uh, consider. And as I was thinking about some of these things I'm, I'm going to list off, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of thinking of what, what Mike Turner often says, you know, that uh, you need to step it up a notch. And, so some of these things are areas that, uh, that, that I need to step it up a notch on. So in Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 28 <clears throat> says, Her children rise up and, and, and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So have you ever bragged on your wife? Have you ever praised her cooking? Have you ever praised her good looks? Have you ever pr praised just little things? Is that something you've done? I see some wives nudging their husbands right now. Shake your head this way. Never compare her to other women. Uh, to, to other women. Your clever comment, maybe she doesn't say it, but it will tell her that you lack wisdom and you lack a genuine appreciation for her as a person, as a human being. 
You can make her feel like a queen in her castle. If you place courtesy and communication in your house, it will grow into a castle. Also for the husband, time spent together. This, this can be difficult and straining, especially when kids and schedules and all that happens. Time spent doing something she likes but you necessarily don't like. How about shopping and not just sitting on that bench over there and letting her go in to, to shop, but actually shopping with her. Maybe letting her pick out a tie for you. <laughs> time spent doing something that, that she likes but you don't like to do. Not forgetting the little things. So I'm, now I'm going to turn to the wife. So I've kind of, kind of hit the husbands kind of hard. I'm going to turn to the wives now. Do you laugh at his jokes? I think that's important. Do you encourage his creativity, his work ethic? Do you show compassion even when it's not due to him? Maybe you've had a hard day too, but maybe he's had a hard day or even a harder day. Do you show gratitude? I also want to turn to Proverbs chapter 24. 3 through 4. Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. <coughs> this is talking about building your house. This is what you and your wife are doing. This is, this is building your house every day, day in and day out. I'm, not, I'm talking about building your relationship every day. <coughs> Growing together spiritually, but growing together every day until you die. My, my grandparents were just one month, I believe, just shy of 69 years in marriage before one of them died in, uh, in, in, in 2006. You know, I can't imagine, you know, that, but in some in the audience, I'm sure, are not far from 50 or 60. Last October, we just reached our 10-year milestone. And that's unusual these days. Just when I talk to people my age, they, they're, they've already been divorced once or twice. But just as this verse points out, that you could be responsible for destroying the home by your own actions. Proverbs 14.1, Every wise woman builds up her household, but the foolish one tears it down with her own hands. The, the foolish woman tearing down her house by her own hands. This can be something that that the wife or the husband could be responsible for. Definitely, definitely applicable to the husband destroying the house, destroying this home that they're working to build together day in and day out. We also need to build upon the rock of faithfulness instead of the sand of disloyalty. All of these gifts are examples of God's faithfulness. He is reliable. He is constant. He can be trusted. If every groom provided these gifts to his bride, marriage and our culture might be considerably different. We must be faithful to the, con to, the, to the covenant that was entered in between man and woman and God that we talked about earlier in the lesson. Psalms 31.23 says, The Lord preserves the faithful but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Proverbs 28.20 20, A faithful man will abound with blessings. Psalms 111.7 The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. You know, faithfulness and trust, there's something that they, they go hand in hand, don't they? A faithful spouse will often and almost always be a trustworthy spouse. <clears throat> Consider the, the uh, woman in Proverbs chapter 31 that we, we brought up earlier. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. And she will have no lack of gain. So her husband is going to trust in her. It's because of there's this relationship, this home that's being built over and over again. Every day, that relationship is growing. It's blooming into something. And trust is, is at its core. Faithfulness is at its core. JFB commentary says that he relies on her prudence and her skill. So there's a reliance, once again, this trust on her that, you know, I, I'm fine with her handling this, this part, 
of whatever the home, she can handle that. I trust her. What kind of woman is this? She is excellent. Excellent is superb, outstanding, admirable. We also want to consider before we close in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, which we read, in light of Hosea 2, 19, 19 through 20. And I want to give some reminders to husbands and wives, and then I want to give some other reminders to the parents of the bride and the groom. This, this should certainly remind us to the husbands and wives that the model for our marriages is God's marriage, just as it was with God's marriage to the Israelites, that covenant to the Israelites, this should also remind us of the seriousness of faithfulness in our marriage. So now some reminders to the parents of the bride and the groom. And really these comments should go without saying, but I'm, I see more and more couples that, that are having this, this problem. Um, but the, the wedding marks the end of that dependency that, and now that man or that woman is now leaving and cleaving to the husband or, or to the wife, whichever the case, and that is God's design. So there, there's a change in the relationship between the parents and, and this bride and the parents of, of the groom. There's, there's a change in that relationship. And a failure to follow this sparks trouble. Why are there mother-in-law jokes? I don't, I don't hear father-in-law jokes. Yeah, maybe I'm gonna, gonna get in trouble for this. Maybe I'm stepping on toes. Maybe I need to step on toes. But are they meddling beneath the surface? Do they miss the closeness that once existed between their child, who's now a, a grown adult, who is now responsible for and beholden to someone else in their life? I, I remember Jr. talking about this one time, and he he referred to it as there's a new norm that happens when this marriage occurs there's a new norm and some people don't get the notice they don't get the memo that there's a new relationship there's a there's a marriage and the son is the head of his new household and he is responsible for his wife and the children that result from that union the wife belongs to her husband she is loyal and she is trusting to him and God only this is God's design may there be no meddling May parents stay out of their adult children's marriages. That's God's design. Let's respect His design. In conclusion, this new relationship will be characterized by, by permanence. This is forever. We've been talking about that tonight in verse 19. By righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and compassion, in faithfulness with the result, with the result of it, Being that Israel will know who her husband is, and that is the Lord, in verse 20. Husbands and wives, if we applied these gifts to our marriages, consider how much stronger they would be. Every marriage needs a healthy dose of righteousness and loving kindness and compassion, faithfulness. Just as Hosea redeemed his unfaithful bride, God is willing to redeem us in our brokenness when we repent and turn from our sins. You know, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a broken home. I grew up with brokenness in my home. We need to realize that God is willing to redeem us when we fall short of His commandments. The invitation is, is for you tonight to hear Romans 10, 17, believe John 8, 24, repent Luke 13, 3, confess Matthew 10, 32, be baptized, Mark 16, 16. And be added to the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18. And be faithful until death, Revelation 2, 10. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Are you building a home day in and day out? Are you working at it? Can you apply more of these things we talked about tonight to your marriage? Can, can us men step it up a notch tonight? If you have sin in your life in a, in a public manner, why don't you come forward as we stand?